Good morning. What a powerful time of worship. I've got to say that's one of the best songs, isn't it? I Surrender. And uh, we're actually talking about a number of issues today where we need uh, to choose to be obedient and to surrender. So it's a perfect song to, to lead into this message today. The first thing I want to do, though, is welcome back Eddie. How about a round of applause for Eddie? Now, if, if you knew... If you're new to uh, Green Slope, you wouldn't know who Eddie is, but he's been a long-term member, but he's been stuck in the Philippines for two or three years. How long has it been? Two years because of COVID, and uh, well, there's been a lot of prayer and a lot of angst about you coming back, Eddie, but really good to see you back. It was a, a great surprise to see you walk through the door this morning, so welcome back. And at some time, we'll have to catch up and, and uh, talk through how that's been for you, because it must have been a very challenging time for you. So, so welcome back. Um, last night, yeah, there was a jazz night fundraiser for chaplaincy, and it's now a monthly event. So if you missed out last night, uh, in 22nd of February, there's a Friday night version of the same thing. And Brett Forster, the bass guitar player from church, his band's going to be playing. So come along, support him, uh, support the uh, chaplains in the uh, Gateway Learning community. It's a very worthwhile event. Uh, still, it was a bit of a later night last night, so maybe a little bit croaky, but uh, a great worthwhile um, event. And by running that monthly, it should be an easy fundraiser for us as a group of chaplains. So it, it definitely was um, a, a blessing to see it happen. On Monday, we had all of 31 people registered, but I'm just driving around, bring it before God, this idea pops in my head, ring Brisbane Jazz Club, because... Who would want to listen to jazz more than people from Brisbane Jazz Club? And you might have seen they were flooded out recently. Well, they've got a three-month reno coming up, so they're closed for three months. So they circulated our flyer to over 17,000 people, and within 24 hours we'd filled. Pretty much. By the Wednesday morning we had 91, and then we, we hit probably 115 all up, and the, and, uh, the capacity was 120. So... Uh, get in early if you're coming to the next one, and there's already uh, a flyer available for that, so keep, keep uh, an eye out for that flyer. But this morning, we're continu continuing with our series through the book of Mark, and this is part eight of uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ the Servant, and we're looking at the servant's paradoxes. Now, paradoxes is a bit of a, a big kind of word, and, and uh, um, I mean, if you think about the term paradox, Usually what comes to mind is a contradiction. If something's a paradox, there's a, it's a contradiction. But there must be more to the word paradox than just meaning contradiction, because otherwise we'd just say contradiction. Okay? And there's a definition of paradox that's going to come up, and I actually really like this definition of what a paradox is. So a paradox is a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement or proposition which, when investigated, may prove to be well-founded or true. And I actually like applying this idea to Jesus' teachings because quite often he would challenge people's thinking by coming at it with a completely different view. He'd turn their thinking upside down by saying something that on the surface sounds absurd or contradictory, but when you investigate what Jesus was really saying, there's a profound truth. Uh, in, in what he's teased out through uh, that paradox, through that uh, supposedly uh, contradictory kind of statement. And he would challenge people's thinking. He'd turn their thinking upside down. And we're very fortunate in this chapter of Mark, and we're looking at Mark chapter 10, there are five different incidents. And pretty much the only common thread between each of these incidents is the fact that Jesus is challenging people's thinking. He's turning their thinking upside down. He's actually saying something that maybe seems paradoxical. There's a contradiction. There's something that doesn't seem to make sense at first, but when you tease it out, you actually find, wow, Jesus is onto something. There's a real deep truth here that he's teasing out in a very, very uh, clever way. He's turning their thinking upside down. And we're actually going to start this morning by looking on uh, Jesus' teaching on divorce. And I've actually uh, titled this uh, particular point the... the the, or the paradox number one is the nature of sex. Okay, and there's a, there's a paradox there that we're going to unpack as we look at Jesus' teaching around this. Now, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, wherever Jesus went, there were crowds of people that uh, would follow him, and he was in the habit of teaching them. He was known as being a teacher. And this day was no different. There was a crowd of people, 
wanting to hear Jesus teach, and he was teaching them. And the Pharisees, as per usual too, came up and they tried to trick Jesus. They took every opportunity they could to try to ask him a question to trick him and make him, I guess, uh, look bad or say something that was against uh, the people and, and, and turn public opinion against him. So they ask him a trick question about divorce. And they're being very sly here because with this question, they knew that it didn't matter how Jesus answered, he'd be offending at least 50% of the population. Because there were two schools of thought around divorce back in Jesus' day. There was one group of religious uh, leaders who taught that you could um, permit it to divorce for absolutely any reason you like. So if, if your wife burns the toast or her, her voice is a little bit annoying or, or you just grow tired of your wife, you could actually divorce her. And there was a, a school of um, Pharisees or teachers, religious teachers in Jesus' day, who basically said, yeah, that, that's fine. But the second school of thought was that there was only a select, a small number of reasons why you could divorce your wife. So they asked Jesus this really sly question, saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, knowing that either way he was going to offend people? But Jesus didn't get involved in their human arguments or opinions about divorce. He actually went back to first principles and actually quoted the Bible from Genesis uh, chapter 1, where, um, and this is a reading from Mark chapter 10, verse 6, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. And the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then verse 11, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. Now, there's a lot in these, in these couple of verses, and there's actually a lot in these verses that we as a society have forgotten. And there's a lot in these verses that go against our human nature. Um, but this standard that Jesus taught um, is the biblical standard. This is God's will on the matter. He actually brings it back to, to first principles, and he asks the question in, in, in exploring this, who made sex and why, and how was it meant to be used? Now, Jesus' disciples were a bit worried about all this. They even thought that Jesus was going too far. Remember, these other religious leaders allowed divorce, but Jesus is basically saying, what man has joined together, uh, as God has joined together, let no man separate. And Matthew's account of this same story, uh, the disciples actually um, pull Jesus aside and, and quiz him about it. And they say, well, if this is a situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry at all. This is a hard teaching to take. It seems like it's, it's too hard. But this stance of Jesus on the matter um, comes straight from the book of Genesis. He's challenging people's thinking. But if you start from the divorce side of the argument, you get a distorted view. Uh, you've got to start with what was intended, what was intended by God regarding sex. Because in these verses, there's a complete plan for human sexuality. It's only three verses, but here uh, uh, Jesus is recounting God's plan for sex, what to do with it, how to harness human sexuality and shape it into a truly fulfilling force for good. And this goes against our selfish human instincts, which want to reduce sex to merely physical pleasure where anything goes. You just have to just consider the porn industry or how technology and even medications these days are shaping society's attitude towards sex and sexual behaviour to see just how obsessed with sexual pleasure we as a society have become. And this is reducing or equating sex purely to pleasure. It's a view of sex that's short-sighted. Uh, it doesn't consider the link between a healthy marriage and uh, the positive effects that has um, on raising children, and it doesn't consider the full function of sex reproductively or relationally. Because sex isn't just about pleasure, it's about so much more. Sex knits together the very fabric of society. And our views about it determine our health, uh, the prosperity of ourselves, our family, our children, and in turn, society. And the paradox is this, to get the most out of sex, don't reduce it to pleasure, as your human nature would tell you. Don't make it about you. Instead, give it purpose and meaning. Put it in the context of a lifelong committed relationship 
uh, that's purpose is to raise the next generation of healthy, well-adjusted people. And this is the message that the Bible teaches on this matter, and it's the message that this world has forgotten. But it's backed up by what we know to be true from research. Uh, around 10 years ago, I was at a professional development session at the um, RBH Hospital, um, part of the Brisbane North Information Forums, and Dr Paula Garrett, who's actually a world-renowned Brisbane-based child psychologist, was talking about different styles of families um, blended through the traditional sort of nuclear families. This is about 10 years ago, but she publicly stated in the secular setting, and this is backed by research, that the best environment in which a child can be raised is where both biological parents are present and there's a high degree of cooperation. And that statement about cooperation is key because if that cooperation's there, not there, it ceases to be the best environment. But where both biological parents are present and there's a high degree of cooperation, the research shows that produces the best results for children, fewer issues and, and they're, they're living healthier uh, uh, lives. And it sounds a little bit like Jesus' model for marriage, doesn't it? And it's backed by research. And look, I know this is a sensitive issue because I know this ideal of marriage isn't everyone's personal experience. Um, and look, I'm not self-righteous in this regard because um, even like my own upbringing, I'm the youngest of seven kids that my mum had to uh, three different fathers. And it was back in the 60s and 70s where that sort of thing was uh, uh, taboo and, and uh, not spoken about and kept secret. And my mum, in fact, did that. And my family tree is so messed up that I didn't know that some of my half-siblings existed till I was 38. And there's still a half-sister that um, was fostered out when she was young. Remember, I'm the youngest. This is all before my time. And I've never met her and probably never will because I believe she might have changed her name. So I'm not being self-righteous about this and I know it's not everyone's experience. And it doesn't matter where you've come from or what your history is. What matters is where you're going with this. Uh, how are you going to take on board Jesus' challenging thinking and, and statements about this and move forward because there's grace and forgiveness enough to cover your past no matter what it is. But the fact of the matter still remains that the best way to produce happy, healthy, well-adjusted kids and get satisfaction out of doing that is to take on board Jesus' teaching from this chapter. Jesus taught that you leave your father and mother and commit yourself for life exclusively to someone of the opposite gender and cooperate with them to raise children. And this matter is vitally important because the other option leads to disaster, and that's backed by evidence as well, by research. There's a famous anthropologist, Dr J.D. Unwin, who studied all the great civilizations and found that within three generations, so only three generations of a civilization throwing off sexual restraint and letting anything go, without exception, each of those great civilizations had collapsed. He found that society can't be creative and sexually free at the same time. It takes sexual restraint and a focusing of emotional and sexual energies towards your spouse at the exclusion of all others for society to function and be productive and not just disintegrate. And this goes against our human nature and our human drive, and it's a paradox. And Jesus here in Mark 10 is challenging their thinking through his teaching, turning their thinking upside down. And I trust Jesus, is, uh, his teaching is turning your thinking upside down about this issue uh, today. From there, some children were brought to Jesus, but Jesus' disciples rebuked the people bringing the children, telling them not to. They just had this important adult conversation about divorce, and they're basically saying, look, it's not for kids, keep the children out. But Jesus heard them rebuke these people and instead said, let them in. Jesus was saying that children are very important. You've got your ideas all wrong. Your ideas are that these children can't have anything of my teaching until they are like adults. Jesus is saying, I say, you adults can't have anything of my kingdom and what I'm saying until you're like these children. It's a reversal of their ideas. It's another paradox. We live in a sophisticated adult world, but Jesus still says, in all your sophistication, unless you become like a child, they're the important ones. To such belongs the kingdom of God. Now, there's a big, hulky guy named uh, uh, Ian Watson. 
known as Watto, and he started a um, men's ministry, Men's Shed. He's an older guy, and he actually passed away a couple of years ago now. But I had him come to our school and talk uh, to a boys' group uh, just about identity and uh, in a sense of manhood. Really lovely Christian guy. And even though he was this big sort of footy coach style guy, really loud and, and, and boisterous, he wasn't too proud to, to come to God as, as a child and call God Dad. He's an example of someone who had this childlike attitude towards God. He, he had become like a child in terms of his attitude. So you see, our ideas are so sophisticated. Uh, we've all grown up to be so intellectual and, uh, and uh, sophisticated as adults. And Jesus is saying, your ideas are all wrong. You have to can't become like children. What is it about little children and their attitude that he said was so important? What did he mean? And I think there are three things in a child that you need as an adult before you can get uh, into the kingdom of God. There's three aspects of uh, a childlike attitude. First of all, you need an open mind. Have you noticed that a child is ready to accept new ideas? They've got a wide open mind. The older we get, the more we close our minds, the more we want to argue, and the more we want to say, I don't believe that. But a little child isn't like that. If you tell them something, they accept it. We need open minds, ones that are willing to receive the truth. The second thing about a child is that they have open hands. They're not too proud to receive. They're willing to accept help. And the further you go in life, the less we're willing to hold out our hand to someone else, to someone else for help. But a child's not like that. A child is willing to open the hand and take help. Jesus said, when you become as a little child, you're willing to say to God, I'll accept your help. We can't be too proud. We've got to have an openness to receive God and the help that he is to us. And the third thing about a little child is an open heart. We adults become cynical and resentful and think that everyone is going to let us down, don't we? You don't have to live too long. I was just talking to someone the other day about their experiences. And uh, it's easy not to have an open heart. To be treated in such a way that you close your heart to people. But a child doesn't think like that. We all start out with open hearts, willing to love and accept and connect with others. And it's as we go through life, that openness is spoiled by experiences of life and our hearts close up. But to come to God, we need an open heart and a willingness to love and trust him. And Jesus said, we've got it all wrong. You disciples, you think Christianity is for sophisticated adults and you're pushing those kids out. Let them in, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And you, you're fond of all these growing up discussions about divorce and all the rest, but until you become like these little children and receive God's kingdom like a child, you'll never enter it. After this, a rich young man comes running up and uh, excitedly to speak to Jesus and he actually falls to his knees before Jesus. He was rich and he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was desperate to know. And this is Mark chapter 10, verse 8, 17 to 22. Good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. It's interesting in verse 22, what does it say? That Jesus looked at him and loved him. And Jesus loved him for these reasons. This guy obviously impressed Jesus. The first reason, this young man wanted life and he really wanted it. He wanted a real life, he wanted eternal life and he knew what he was after. So far, he'd just been existing. 
uh, he wanted to live, really live, so he came running to Jesus. Secondly, he admitted, admitted that he hadn't got life. Even though he was young, very rich and very powerful, this rich young ruler hadn't got life. Thirdly, he recognised that if you're going to get life, then someone is going to have to give it to you. And he uses the word inherit. That's probably how he got his wealth, being so young. He probably inherited it. So he asked Jesus, how do I inherit inter- eternal life? And uh, Jesus uh, replies. Um, but the answer that he gives wasn't that palatable. Fourthly, this guy was prepared to do anything to get it. He asked, what must I do? Fifthly, he believed the answer lay with Jesus. It's incredible when someone realises that when you want real life and you haven't got it, and when you're prepared to do anything to get it, the man you need to go to is Jesus. And then he refers to Jesus as good master, which is very interesting. And Jesus' comments... uh, uh, so that are really interesting and a paradox in themselves. Jesus says, why do you use the word good? You should only use that for one person in the whole universe, and that's God. Now, is this Jesus saying that he's not good? No, it's nothing of the sort. It's Jesus saying, do you think I'm God? Because only God's good. Why do you call me good since that's a word you'd only use about God? Why are you asking that? Why are you saying that? Have you seen that I'm God? Do you realise that because I'm God, I can give you life? But Jesus then went out to ask, how good do you think you are? What are the commandments? Have you kept them? When the rich young ruler says, I've kept all this since I was a boy, uh, he's saying, I've tried to be good. I've tried to keep the commandments. I've tried to live decently but it doesn't bring life. There's got to be more that I need to do. And Jesus loved him for his honesty and sincerity. Here's a young man, he's tried being good and it doesn't lead him anywhere. He's tried to find life and he hasn't found it. He's prepared to do anything to get it, so he asks, well, tell me what to do. And Jesus said, there's one thing you need, only one thing. Now, what was that one thing that he lacked? It wasn't anything to do with his money. He had lots of that. What was the one thing that he lacked? And Jesus said, the one thing that you lack, that you need if you're truly going to live, is me. Me. Give up everything you have and follow me. But the trouble here is that there's something that's going to get in the way. You see, you can't have Christ and everything else. It doesn't matter who comes to Christ. There will be one thing in their life where Jesus says, get rid of it, and you can have me. Go and deal with that, then come back and follow me. It may be something you possess, or it may be some relationship, but Jesus says, you can't have that, and me too. Cut it right out. It may not be money, as it was in this man's case, but he's saying, follow me, and that will bring you life. But forsake that thing or you won't be able to follow me. And the one thing that this man lacked was Jesus. And at that point, the young man turned around and went. Nobody is quite so unhappy as to come so near to Jesus as that and turn away because they weren't prepared to pay the price. The young man's face dropped and he looked so unhappy. You see, the third paradox is that wealth makes life harder. It makes it harder to follow Christ. Christ lost that young man that day. The young man couldn't have both. In fact, he didn't want eternal life more than anything else. And when the choice came, he let it go. And when he went away, Jesus sighed and said, it is incredibly hard to be rich, incredibly hard. And the disciples were absolutely astonished. They thought that everything came easy to the rich. But wealth actually makes things harder. The thought being that if you can get money, everything comes to you easily. And because things come to you easily on earth when you have money, you can think that things will come easily to you in heaven too. But Jesus was saying to that young man, all your money is invested in earth. Give to the poor and get it invested in heaven. 
Then the disciples said, well, if the rich, a rich man can't get into heaven, who can? Jesus said, it's quite impossible for man, but not impossible for God. Verse 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and they said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but to God all things are, sorry, impossible, but, all thing, but to God all things are possible with God. Notice this, that Jesus said earlier that little children can walk in for such is the kingdom of God. But rich men, you, try, you might as well try to push a camel through the eye of a needle as to try to get a rich man converted. And in fact, he said it's quite impossible, but he said God can do it. God can get a camel through the eye of a needle. God can get a rich man through the gate of repentance into the kingdom. And once he's through, what a power he can be for good. So it's not impossible, just hard. Then in verse 32, there's a dramatic picture here. They're on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Jesus' face like flint was striding out ahead down the road to Jerusalem and they all knew the danger that was waiting there and the disciples were behind him. They knew what was coming. And Jesus turned around and tells them, I know what's going to happen to me. They're going to spit on me, they're going to whip me, and they're going to kill me. But then he said, come, come on, we must go. And they were even more afraid. He knew it all. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And this tells us that the cross was no accident. It didn't catch Jesus unawares. He walked straight into it. He planned it, and he did it. The cross was utterly deliberate. He said, they're all going to do uh, these things to me, but come to Jerusalem anyway. And then he said something else. It's all right. Three days later, I'll be back. I'll rise from the dead. You know, they never quite took that in. When it all happened, they still didn't believe. But it did happen. They had this sense that they were building to some sort of climax and and something was going to happen soon. They were coming to the the capital city. And James and John, instead of thinking of the cross, thought of a crown. Verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. It's a a pretty tall tall order, isn't it? Whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Uh, Jesus answered, Well, They replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in glory. They thought he'll soon be on a throne. He'll soon be the king. We can uh, sense things are building up and uh, uh, they, they came forward with this request and they're basically asking, Lord, can you make that throne a three seater? And Jesus said to sit on my right and on my left. Uh, Do you know what you're asking? Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink from? Can you be baptised into what I'm going to be plunged into? Can you? They didn't know for sure, but they said, well, yes, we can. All right, he said, you will. And in the end, they both suffered very greatly in later life for their Christian faith. One martyred and another a prisoner in exile. But even if you're able to... I can't tell you who will be on my right or my left, he said. And then he he got the 12 of the disciples together and he says, you know what, everyone else, they like to lord it over people. They like to be in charge and, 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 and be the boss. But not so with you. Others, if they want to be great, they make everyone else their servant. You be great by making yourself the servant. It's another paradox. Jesus says that the first will be last and the last will be first. And even Jesus came not to be served but to serve others. And then he told them for the first time the meaning of the cross. And this verse that's coming up, this is actually the key verse for this entire sermon series and one of the key verses in the book of Mark. And it's Mark chapter 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. His death on the cross is going to be a ransom. When Jesus dies, he'll be serving people more than he's ever served them before. Because in dying, he'll be setting them free. That's what a ransom is, a price that's paid to release someone from captivity, to set them free. And Jesus' servant nature meant that he was willing to do that. So the fourth paradox is that Jesus' most glorious moment, his glory, is to be his death on a cross. To get to Jerusalem, Jesus goes through Jericho, one of, one of the older cities around, and I think in his history, one of the most uh, uh, corrupt. And again, there was a big crowd around him, and he was, uh, while he was there, a blind man had heard the commotion and found out that it was Jesus that was passing by, a blind beggar. And this man thought to himself, this is my only chance. I've heard about Jesus. This is my one and only chance to be healed. And he started to yell at the top of his voice, Son of David, have mercy on me. And once again, the people had the wrong idea as to who was important. They told the blind beggar to be quiet, but the blind beggar shouted even more, Son of David, have mercy on me. The people were thinking that Jesus isn't interested in blind beggars. Little did they know Jesus. Jesus said, fetch him here. And then came the great moment. This blind man was told that his faith in going on asking and yelling until he got through was going to make him well. And Jesus restores his sight. And at the end of this account, the blind man rose up and followed Jesus. The rich man, Jesus said, follow me. But he had too much money and he couldn't follow the beggar had nothing to lose, so he jumped up and followed Jesus. The richer you come to God, the harder it is to follow. The poorer you come, the easier. And when you have nothing to lose, you can just get up like that and come. That's why Jesus said in this lifetime, publicans, harlots, sinners, got into the kingdom of heaven before respectable religious people. It's still true that when a man is at the bottom and has nothing to lose, he finds it easier to follow Jesus than those who have so much. It's much easier for a beggar because he has nothing to lose. Another profound thing in this account is what the beggar said. He called Jesus son of David. Now at this point there was only one other man who called Jesus that before. Interestingly, that was another blind man. These two blind men could see who Jesus truly was. They saw the truth about Jesus, that he was the Messiah, that he was the son of David sent to Israel. And just a few days later, the whole crowd was going to shout, Hosanna, son of David. They were all going to shout it. But the paradox here is that it took a blind man to see it first. But where are you at today? Has Jesus been challenging your thinking? Has he been turning your thinking upside down? You see, Jesus has earned the right to challenge our thinking and to speak into our lives because of who he is and what he's done. There's authority when Jesus says, don't divorce. When Jesus says, give up your riches and follow me. Imagine God in the flesh as a human being. Well, you don't actually have to imagine because that's Jesus. And this Jesus went to the cross to set us free. Has Jesus been challenging you and your thinking about marriage and sex today? Has he been challenging your sophisticated adult, adult thinking today, challenging you to become like a child and open your mind to believe him, open your hands to accept his healing and salvation and help, and open your heart to love and follow him simply like a child? Has he been challenging your thinking about wealth or whatever it is for you that your choosing is more important to him? What are you being challenged to give and give up? And what are you willing to accept Jesus' and are you willing to accept Jesus' cross as his crowning glory 
Are you willing to accept that price that was paid to set you free? Jesus is who he says he is. You've just got to look at these accounts in the book of Mark, how people reacted. There was a buzz around Jesus. People came running to him, falling on their knees, desperate to know how they could have eternal life. Blind beggars determined to be healed, called out to him despite a large crowd trying to silence them. And people like Peter, James and John were willing to give their all, even their lives, to follow him. So where do you stand today? Don't stay blind to this truth. Are you willing to follow Jesus? And that's really the crux of the matter. Jesus having done all this, teaching this way, uh, being crowded by people, having opponents that Jesus pushed through, uh, determined to get to a cross that he knew uh, was his destiny. What's your response to all that? Are you willing to follow Jesus? But as the band comes up, we're just going to pray. We're going to pray into that. Let's do that now. Lord, we just thank you for coming to set this example for us. Lord, you've reached out and you've revealed yourself to us. Not everyone accepts this revelation of who you are and what you're taught, Lord, but we do. And Lord, I pray for those within earshot, Lord, who haven't reached that point where they're determined to follow you. I just pray that you'd be working in them and each of us, Lord, to surrender more and more to you, Lord. We surrender. And we pray for those who struggle with that idea. We just pray that you would work in them. Lord, help them to see the truth. Lord, help us to communicate the truth even more clearly, Lord. Lord, we just acknowledge how powerful this message is. How people reacted 2,000 years ago, Lord, it, it, it's just mind-blowing. And we just pray, Lord, for a revival. People turning back to this message, Lord, knowing that you are God knowing that you are Lord and that you're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our all, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for this example. We just thank you for this sermon series, Lord, and the way that you're speaking to us through it. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.